Hi, thanks, thanks for joining us today. I'm Kevin Kay. I'm the president of Spike TV. Um, Khalif Browder's story is, is a really important one to tell. It's the story of an ambitious young man with his whole life in front of him who became a victim of the criminal justice system. A young man who spent an unthinkable three years in prison, including two years in solitary confinement, awaiting trial for a crime he didn't commit and for which, unbelievably, he was never charged. It's a story that's so relevant today, one that we feel will honor Khalif's legacy and we believe will inspire much needed change. When Harvey Weinstein, who has been a great friend, a great supporter, a great partner of Spike from day one, brought this project to us, I immediately knew that we had to do it. I remember, I remember a few years back when Khalif's story came to light, including that incredibly moving piece in The New Yorker. Anyone who has followed Khalif's journey realized that something has to be done about our current criminal justice system. It's time for change, and it's time to tell Khalif's story. We're thrilled to partner with the very best in the business to tell that story. The Weinstein Company, of course, the talented filmmakers who you'll meet later, and of course, Sean, Jay-Z, Carter, and Rock Nation. I'd also like to thank Vanita Browder and the Browder family for their support. They're here with us today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Harvey Weinstein from the Weinstein Company. Harvey. Well, oh, I want to thank uh, Kevin and Sharon, and also say when Jay and uh, Rock Nation made the deal with uh, the Weinstein Company, this was the first project he brought to us. And Kevin and Spike stepped up in a big way, and uh, you know, with one meeting, you know, um, you know, they greenlit the project. So we announced uh, uh, we announced our first lip deal on on last Thursday. And just to show you how, as Jay said, how efficient we are as a partnership, four of the episodes are filmed already. So I think that's good for a week now. Okay, those are the jokes. <laughs> Should I say I'm Mike Pence? You know, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and deflect and deflect every question. Uh, this is, okay, this is Jenna First, you know, our director. He made a name for himself with do documentaries like Brick City and Chicago Land. Next to him is Nick Sandow, our writer and executive producer. You might remember, you might know uh, Nick from Orange Is the New Black as an actor, but he is a filmmaker, including making a movie called The Wannabe, executive produced by Mort Morty. Scorsese. In the audience, Mike Gasparro. I just put that together. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In the audience is Mike Gasparro, the series producer, and Julia Nason, the series executive producer. These two here. So, um, uh, okay. Um, let me just get to this. Uh, you know, I... Uh, just, I want to introduce Jay, and um, I don't mean to embarrass him. This might embarrass him, but I really mean this. You know, and this is sincere. He is truly a Renaissance man. The work that he does in the arts, you know, as a musician, as a music producer, as a film producer, television producer, stage producer, you know, is on the cutting edge, you know, and, and educates us, teaches us, and certainly me, you know, uh, as a huge fan, his company title. Is terrific. I mean, it's artists running, you know, their own music streaming, and, uh, and it keeps growing and growing and growing. And we use it for movies and content, and you know, just one of the true great innovators. And I'm so pleased we've known each other over the course of years. I just make no mistake. This was, you know, I must be honest. Jay brought this project to us. You know, as a team, we brought this to Spike. You know, uh, it's an amazing start to, I think, an amazing partnership, you know, between us. There'll be projects like this. There'll be projects that are entertaining, you know, as well. But everything will have, you know, I think, something to say that's important. And uh, it's just great that the team, you know, is doing this. So I just want to introduce truly what I said before, a Renaissance man and, for me, a friend, Jay-Z. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, I... Um, Thank you, Spike, for helping us tell this important tale. It's a very timely uh, story. I look at Khalif Browder as a modern-day prophet. Uh, our prophets come in many different shapes, forms, and 
different mediums or whatever. This 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 young man, just by you know the fact that uh, he brought all of us here today, lets you know um, just how powerful of a soul he was. Um, I came across his story in the New Yorker, and I and I called Shaka immediately. Shaka Pilgrim, who worked with me forever, she's sitting here today. I called Shaka and I said, Shaka, um, I need to meet this young man. Could you find him? And you know, I was thinking that you know it would take a while. And she called me back. You know, my phone kept ringing. I didn't answer because sometimes I don't answer a call. <laughs> and she, she kept calling, so I knew it was important. And I was like, okay. And she said, uh, you're not going to believe this. She was at another event and ran across his, uh, the guy that was his lawyer who was helping him out, who was brilliant young man who was uh, helping Khalif seek justice and it just happened that day so it was meant to happen and uh, Khalif came to the office and we met and I just wanted to give him words of encouragement that I saw his story and that I'm proud of him for making it through and to keep pushing and told me that he was going to college and for me you know this story um you, you know, in the movies, in some movies that are told, the story ends differently. Then I got a phone call from Shaka, and she told me that uh, Khalif had taken his own life. And, you know, I was thrown, of course, and I was asking myself, man, this story doesn't end like this. It's not supposed to end this way. That's not, that's not how the story goes. Not in the movies, not in real life. And... Shortly thereafter, things start happening. Uh, Obama talked about, you know, a crime bill and uh, eliminating uh, solitary confinement for minors. And I know that was Khalif. And, you know, all these things start happening. And, you know, we came across these fabulous filmmakers. And everything just start happening the way it should happen. And I knew right there that, you know, he was a prophet. You know, some of our prophets, you know, go in tragedy. Martin Luther King it ends tragically, but what comes from it, uh, the life and the, the next iteration of, and the lives saved and how, how this young man has moved culture forward um, is incredible. And uh, I think you should be incredibly, and you are incredibly proud of your son and what he's accomplished and I know it's difficult for you and the family to not have him, to not be able to speak to him, but he's here. He's here today. He's here today, and he's, he's done more in 19 years than a lot of us would do in a lifetime. So um, on that note, I, I would like to thank you for bringing us um, Khalif's energy into this world and I would like to introduce his beautiful mother so she can speak. And I want to thank all the people involved with us telling this very important story. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Um, I'm very glad to be here today. And I want to acknowledge the organization of Stop Solitary for Kids. It's a very important organization. and of which uh, I and Mr. Prestia um, are both board members. Stop Solitary for Kids is a national campaign to end solitary confinement for youths in both juvenile and adult facilities in the U.S. This is a very important organization and I'm very thankful that this series is aligning itself with this work of this organization. It's an awesome organization. Um, it's too late, unfortunately, for my son, Khalif, but it will definitely benefit other youths so that they won't have to endure what my son did. And thank you for your tireless work. Hey, thank you, everybody. Um, before we open up for questions, we're going to see a clip. Um, it's only for this room only, so please, no recording. Uh, we put your cameras down when we, uh, we play the clip. 
So again, thank you so much. We're going to show the clip and then come back with some questions. Okay, we're going to open up some questions from the media. We have some uh, guys with mics walking around. Hi, I'm Chloe with CNN. Uh, this question is for Mr. Carter. What do you think is the answer to stopping police brutality against African American men in this country? Compassion. Um, you have compassion for someone's plight, things that they go through. We're all going to fall short of grace at times. Um, you know, judgment is you know the enemy of of compassion, and. You know, when you are able to identify that, yeah, we're, we're, we're all not perfect, and we may make mistakes, every, all of us, every single one of us in here. And when you have compassion on what someone's going through and their plight, you know, and also you have to have, um, I believe, my personal opinion, that having a camera on someone creates more um, distrust. If, if we have to have an, uh, um, an exchange and it has to be recorded, um, something's wrong there. Something's broken. So a, a camera can't fix the, you know, the relationship between a person that's uh, hired to protect and serve and society. It has to be a relationship. It has to be um, respect on both sides. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, this, I'm Miles Hanser from The Fader. Um, I have a question for Mr. Carter. Um, I know in your remarks just now you mentioned that uh, President Obama worked on repairing some of the problems with mass incarceration in this country. Do you believe that any of the presidential candidates running for office um, will continue that legacy? And if so, which ones? Uh, you have hopes. You know, you have hopes that we're all moving forward as a society. Because um, it's, not, it's not a political issue. It's a human issue. It's a, again, it's a, a story of compassion and empathy. And in order for us to move forward, the, this conversation needs to move forward. And... It's just life. It's life. It's, 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 and we, where we are right now, it's, it's just imagine a metaphor. If, you, if you're going down a road and a, and a sign says, uh, end of the road in 15 feet, and you take your car and you just barrel past it, you know, at some point you're going to go off a cliff. That's just the way the world works, you know? And, you know, we need to keep pushing the conversation forward. And, no, again, it's not a political issue. It's a, it's a human issue, and I would hope that any human being would know that that's the right thing to do. Hi, my name is Peter Splendori. I'm with the Daily News. Uh, my question is also for Mr. Carter. So obviously the story of Khalif Browder is very important to tell, and uh, that was a very powerful clip you just showed us. My question is, how do you hope that viewers are impacted by the series as well as like decision makers within society. It's the kind of story, uh, Khalif's is a kind of story that you can't ignore. 16 years old, right? If everyone in here imagined their cousin, nephew, little brother, 16, 16 years old, getting arrested in America, you know, land of the free, home of the brave, and everyone's innocent until proven guilty. And this young man at 16 was arrested and held in uh, Rikers Island for three years. Three years where he was in solitary confinement and subjected. That's real footage. That's not doctored footage. Uh, these guys did a beautiful job with um, going into the archives and getting all these. This, this, this is real footage. And this is a real woman uh, with real pain. And you can imagine that... Uh, you know, seeing that, it's very hard to ignore. You know, it's very hard to ignore. And it's our job. It's our job to use our, our mediums, your job, my job, uh, Harvey's job, 
people at Spike to use our voice to get these stories out so we can have a discussion about it and we can we can move forward and fix things because it's broken currently. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Tashar from the New York Post. I just, my question is for Mr. Carter as well. Does it strike a chord to you or a nerve when you mention this product and people may not know who Khalif is? Um, no. You know, everything happens at its time. You know, are you asking me that well, Does it bother me may, when people don't A lot know. of people don't know this case and don't know who he is. So well, does it strike a chord? Like, you know, does it no, strike No, no, uh, that doesn't, that, no, not at all. That's why we're doing this. That's why uh, everyone is here and, you know, um, we're here to bring awareness and light to uh, Khalif's story. The, the reason we're here. So, no, it doesn't. And by the time we're done, everybody will know the story, not only in America, but globally. Talk about hi, yep. uh, Cynthia Littleton with Variety. Can you talk a little more specifically about how you have gotten that footage of the interrogation? Presumably, you had to get it from law enforcement. That's the directors. Law yeah. enforcement. Yeah. And also, for Harvey and Sean, can you talk about of all the places you could have taken this project? Why was Spike TV the fit? Well, um, I can't reveal my sources, but I obtained it, and it's important for people to see this young 16-year-old. Uh, you know, teenager, um, and and very ironic that the clock is is uh, zoomed in on because that was really the minute, the second that his life took a dramatic and horrible turn, and that's how fragile uh, his life was, um, and many um, young men's life, young people of color's life, is in America. That one simple second, one five minute interaction can change your life forever, and it did for Khalif Browder. So I'm glad we obtained it, and uh, I think it's an important thing to kind of look at. You want to question. answer the question about Spike? Yeah. Um, Why'd you the, bring it to me? <laughs> the, um, Kevin and Sharon, you know, um, Sharon's going to get the Medal of Honor if she deals with my brother, you know, a lot. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, so David Glasser, who's done an amazing job, you know, on this project, and uh, Megan, you know, our head of TV, were in conversations with Kevin about something else. He said, I want to revolutionize, you know, and do amazing things, you know, with the network. And um, we talked to him about this project, and he wouldn't let us out of the room. I mean, it was just like we were on our way to see the usual suspects, so to speak. And Jay, you know, uh, came from remote. We made a a pitch and that was it I mean they just said we're doing it and you're not seeing anybody else and when somebody's that passionate in the room you know that they're gonna follow through and go all the way you know you make you know TV you make deals all the time and then they say oh we didn't promote it oh we didn't do it this is the kind of way the story gets to be told in answer to your question a press conference today you know and then the fact that they have that footage is Amazing, and the fact that Khalif is what they told me, he was smart enough to know where the camera was. You know, in other words, when they dragged him off to get beaten, you know, whatever, he, you notice he goes back to where the camera was. He had that innate sense, maybe the foresight, to know that's, that this was going to happen. So I think he's Kevin, Doug Herzog, the head of the networks, I think they're, they put on the line. And when you see that kind of passion, I'm never going to say no to that. Yeah, and I think, you know, we don't do a lot of these, right? And so we can pay a lot of attention to it. Um, you know, we're in 90 million homes. We have an audience that we know is interested in justice. Um, and this is a story, hopefully, about justice, ultimately. Um, but, you know, bringing it to us gives us we, – we will be behind it. We will market it. We will promote it. We want this story to be heard and told. And I think that, you know, that's part of the reason that, that this team brought it to us, because they know that we're not – going to bury it, we're going to tell it and promote it. And, you know, just our history in documentaries, as I'm sure some of you know, we started with the Thin Blue Line. Randall Adams was in jail. And relentlessly, we released the movie 12 times in Dallas, where he was, and that to get that district attorney 
to, and Randall Adams walked out of jail into my office. So I know what the power of a movie can do. We did Citizen Four, which won the Oscar. We did Fahrenheit 9-11. Watch that movie now and see how unbelievably, you know, when Jay talks about prophecy, it's incredible. Or Sicko or, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, we know that these kind of things and, you know, the kind of things, you know, can ch even 20 feet from stardom. We took those backup singers who never got any attention, now are headlining, working all the time, and also set a career path for others. So this is not our first rodeo, and we're only going to go, you know, to make a change where we can have the impact. And Sean brought the project to us, so we had no idea. I, I'm going to be honest, I didn't even know who Khalif was until Sean showed us footage and talked to us about the project. And now I want to make sure everybody knows. Hi, Corey. No. Corey Grove from Rolling Stone. I was just wondering, you know, there's obviously a lot to his story about the, you know, the criminal justice system. There's a lot to his story about the implications of solitary mm -hmm. confinement. You know, he's a 16-year-old. What is it that you hope people take away after watching this from Khalif's story? It's to you. Uh, well, just that this young man um, got dealt a horrible hand um, in the way it happened, and that his story and that his life, you know, inspires others um, and save, saves others' lives. I think it's very clear that uh, solitary confinement for a 16-year-old is wrong to every single person in here. I think that's um, it's inhumane. It's inhumane. It's, uh, um, it's, it's difficult for me to find the words. It's so, it's so inhumane. It's like, yeah, I hope that people see the story and I mean, because we're, we're, we're the voice, the society. We, we affect change. We can change everything. You know, it's us. It's our voices. Our voices are stronger than ever. And, you know, if, if everyone in this room is like, I don't agree with this happening to a 16-year-old, and that won't happen again. It won't happen again. It's that simple. It's... Thank you. Hi, Gabri yeah. Gabrielle from Us Weekly Magazine. My question's for Mr. Carter. Do you see this project as something that families should watch together um, to open the lines of communication about the story? And if so, what age would you show it to your own kid? Yeah, I think it's very important. And I think that's, that's for you to, you know your child. You know, some, some children are more mature at, the, you know, age is just the amount of time you've been on the earth. It's not... It doesn't signify your level of knowledge, your intelligence. Um, and again, information means nothing. You can have all the information in the world, inspiration. And if you feel that your child would be inspired by a story like this, inspired to have compassion, inspired to change, inspired to stand up for change, uh, um, then, you know, that's, that's a parent's decision. You know, for me, my child is... Uh, I talk to my child uh, as as I speak with you ever since you were born. So, um, you know, I probably show it to her before most people would think that uh, is uh, acceptable. But my child is my child. She's, you know, that's our relationship. It depends on the relationship that you have with your child and how much you trust your child to handle certain information because it's, it seems in there that's pretty hardcore, and uh, and she may, or he may, your child may um, get like not be able to sleep at night. But it's the reality, it's the harsh realities of you know of what transpired, and um, so that's a choice for you. Did I answer? Yes. Any more questions? Hi, Marcus Jones from BuzzFeed. My question is for Mr. Carter. So um, a lot of rappers 
specifically. A lot of musicians get into producing film and TV, but a lot of rappers have been successful at it. Why do you think that is, and what do you bring to the table as a producer? Uh, um, I, I guess uh, me personally, I just found that uh, I thought of this on the way here, uh, that I tell stories through different mediums. Sometimes I tell it through spoken words, sometimes I tell it through television, sometimes television and film, sometimes I tell it through fabric, you know, but it's all um, part of the same story. And it's all part of, uh, you know, flawed characters finding uh, some sort of evolution. And the medium doesn't matter. So I think with, with artists in general, we have a sensitivity to telling stories. And the medium doesn't matter whether we're, you know, recording in a studio, shooting a video, or producing film. It all has that same line of, you know, telling stories and sensitivity to it. And so when you really tapped into it and you're doing it for the, you know, right reasons, you'll be successful at it because it's all just storytelling. I can tell you that uh, Jay's going to produce the Richard Pryor movie with Lee Daniels directing. So, I mean, each time, you know, I think you'll see these projects be something that hit the cultural zeitgeist, you know. Um, you know, one day we'll find something really commercial to do. <laughs> but not now. We're going to make it. Richard Pryor is commercial. I mean, <laughs> yeah. which they, you don't get more commercial. <laughs> this is our conversation after, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> There's nothing more commercial than Richard Pryor. His story is an American story. Yes. Uh, you, you, you understand how many lives he's touched. I mean, from every single comedian to rappers like Biggie Smalls. Well, I won't recite the lyric because we got Miss Brown in the audience, but <laughs> y'all know y'all know the lyrics. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, hi, my name is Rahel. I'm from the Huffington Post, and I just had a question for Mr. Carter as well. Um, so, uh, before Khalif passed away, he uh, stopped by the Huffington Post. Be spoke with him, he described his horrific experience in Rikers, so I just wanted to know how do you hope to sort of further his legacy and what do you um, yeah, just furthering his legacy and what your thoughts are on that um, with these, with every single person in the room that's, that's, that's um, um, played a part in this, filmmakers despite to um, Harvey and um, you know, everyone uh, you know, we hope to put this in front of as many people as we can and you know um, his legacy is like I said uh, in, in the opening you know you can see it already touching so much change from you know um, the solitary confinement program that um, Ms. Brown is on the board of to you know Obama's ending the solitary, solitary confinement of minors to uh even the, the ivy in the spring, I don't know if y'all saw it in the thing, that's, that was his bedroom window. That, that wasn't, that's not a plant. That's not, that's not something that we shot for film. That's, that's life happening, you know? Any more questions? Okay, thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.